yeah, so there's the cover of the book, uh, and uh, sort of pleased to see it sort of uh, hitting the hitting the streets now. Uh, and what I'm going to do first uh, is then ask my good friend uh, Professor Chris Watley, who uh, improves on his good nature yet again, uh, having uh, very kindly looked at sort of some of the first early rushes uh, to see uh, where he could sort of advise me, you know, on. Uh, contextualizing some of it a bit better than it had been uh, and uh, putting up with me bending his ear about it at the football on a Saturday. So uh, Chris, if you'd like to say a few yeah. words before I will do. Great pleasure, Steve, to be here. Um, great to see so many people out there. Uh, out Could I just before, before I say anything about the, the book itself, just say how pleased I am to see that, uh, that, that, that there's a, 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 a acknowledgement, if you like, to Charlotte, the late Charlotte Lyth, uh, here in memory of Charlotte Lyth, 1941 to 2021. Um, not least because Charlotte was a was someone I, I knew well, but she was also president of, of this society at, at one time. But equally important, and this takes me into, into what I'd like to say in the next two or three minutes, and it will only be two or three minutes. Um, and that is her father was a teacher of mine when I was uh, young, and um, once upon a time. Uh, and it, towards the end of his life, he was very Bond with me for some kind of reason. I think it was a bit of a, a lad at university and he, 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 he tracked my career, which, which, which wasn't bad actually, um, given my start in life. And um, he, I, had a, he, he, I went to dinner at his house in Bunny Ferry um, towards the end of his life and he said something like this, Chris, do you think there's anything more to be taught, learned about Scottish history? Do we not know it all? Like, that's about 10 years ago. And of course, there's so much more to know. And as this book, um, uh, Steve friendly put together, um, proves that there is so much more to know, so much more work to be done, so much more fun to be had, actually. Because at the end of the day, yeah, history is it's fun where it should be. Um, this is a, I think it's an important book. Um, I've been taught by people up to date, Edgar Live. The Jacobites, well, they hardly featured on, on the, uh, on, in the university curriculum. But having said that, Scottish history didn't feature much in the university mm -hmm. curriculum in those days either. But when it did feature, it was seen as a kind of uh, romantic, uh, lost cause of little significance other than for decorating shortbread tins and so on and so forth. Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, wonderful, wonderful escapade, uh, Prince in the Head Up and all that kind of stuff. But in the last, um, well, actually 30 or 40 years, something quite um, remarkable has happened in terms of Jacobite studies. And the Jacobites now um, are seen, um, have been portrayed, and, and are seen as a, a very powerful political movement, not only in Scotland, but in Britain and indeed um, with, with, with all sorts of important European uh, connotations. Um, but Because after all, um, the Jacobites were a way into defeating the ascendant uh, United Kingdom, which, which of course had been united in the kingdom in, in the, with the Union of 1707. So the Jacobites um, are now big in terms of historiography or, or the way Scottish history is taught and understood. And in fact, um, you now can read um, the, the 18th century being described as the Jacobite century. Um, and ironically, those that, that they're now, and it's, 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 it's indicated in the title here, those people who oppose the Jacobites are called the anti-Jacobites. Now, <laughs> this, this, has been, this is a huge turnaround in the way we see things, because actually, the Jacobites are the anti-Whigs. The Whigs are the establishment party after the revolution in, 17, in 1688, 1689. Uh, and the Jacobites should be the, the anti-Whigs. But they've actually grown in such significance in terms of uh, what you can read about in 18th century Scotland, Britain, and indeed Europe. Um, so little actually has been written in recent times um, about the Whigs, about the Hanoverians. And one of my... Um, purposes or, or, or missions in, in recent years has been to try and retell the Whig story, retell the story of the Hanoverians in Scotland and Britain and what that was all about and why the Hanoverians were, uh, were, were maintained their hold over, uh, over the state of Great Britain in the 18th century and, and, and beyond. 
However, very few people have followed me in this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this mission, if you like. And so I wrote an article about, I think in 2012, hoping that, that this would open the door to uh, a whole series of, of theses and articles and so forth um, in my support. But nobody has come, come out of my support until Steve. <laughs> <laughs> this wonderful book, and of course, for some reason, it's it so good to see it because, you know, you will read in the literature about the, the trials and tribulations and sacrifices of the Jacobites, the heroes, you know, who lost their life at Sheriff Muir and Culloden and all the rest of it, um, hard done to by this British state. But actually, the, the, the thing is that Scotland was divided quite starkly between the Jacobites and the Hanoverians. And the Hanoverians, or had supporters of the Hanoverians, the Protestant House of Hanover, had a hard time too in early 18th century Scotland. It was not a lot of fun being in a place like Perth, which was in a Jacobite, but there was, there was a lot of Jacobites around. It wasn't a lot of fun being a Hanoverian here. Um, and indeed, in many other places, well, the, the, the Lord Provost of Perth this time um, wrote, and the, the letters are in the archives here, um, about the, the trials and tribulations he was facing as a Lord Provost um, as, and a Hanoverian. So um, it's great, Steve, to see this book come out because this is an important book, it's an important contribution. It demonstrates what life was like for a Hanoverian in, in, a, in a reasonably, in, a, in an average or typically middle-sized Scottish borough. Um, and, and, and for that, um, Steve is to be commended. The book um, I have read um, two or three times. <laughs> 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 All the time. And it's, <laughs> it's a, a splendid publication. And in fact, it joins with the rest of the splendid publication. Because it should be a whole lot more to be a member of the publishing. All the members of the publishing. Historical Society is, has produced for many years some of the best local history publications in Scotland. And it's great that that worked. Carries on, and it's appropriate that the, that the, that the present, present president, uh, Steve Connolly, uh, uh, has joined the, the ranks of those who have written such fine publications. So um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I know you'll, listen, you'll enjoy listening to, to Steve. So thanks very much, folks. Uh, I have to apologize for the sort of on the front cover here. Uh, I can remember being at another event uh, sponsored by History Scotland where Chris and Murray Pittock were talking about Jacobites and Whigs, etc. And he, uh, Chris remarked that it was important that the title mentioned Jacobites because if it just mentioned Whigs, not many people would have shown up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I took that sort of cue to make sure that. You know, as many buzzwords as possible. <laughs> in the, uh, the front cover. But I also, uh, a, a friend of mine, when I showed him the draft of the cover, he said, you maybe should have had your name in a slightly different font, because it makes it look as if you're the pioneering <laughs> <laughs> last night. And Jack, but I like to think myself as neutral. <laughs> Others will judge on, on the read the book. Uh, so tonight, all I'm going to do is just say a few words about the sort of general layout of the book and, and, and cover some of the sort of bare bones of it, because I don't want to discourage anybody from uh, buying it. Uh, <laughs> those of you who are getting it, whether you want it or not, as members of the society, I can only apologize. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go and see what we've got. So, uh, I've, I've, you know, inspired choice of sort of chapter titles, <laughs> early life. Uh, George Miller was a, a Relatively local here to Perth, he was actually born in Timbermore, although we can't actually find his birth kind of record in the parish registers. There's actually quite a gap round about the period that he was born, but we know he was born round about 1688. So I say in the blurb on the back, he lived through interesting times. You know, basically, he uh, he was probably there at the sort of glorious revolution and the uh, the claim of rights, sort of establishing William as Mary's King and Queen of Scotland. He lived through the Union of the Parliaments. Uh, uh, he lived through all the Jacobite rebellions, etc. This is uh, a, a map of Perthshire, part of Perthshire around about the time. And he was from a place called 
uh, Colt Malundi, which you can see, if you can see Perth there, if you just track a little bit to the left, you'll see something that says Colt Malindo. Uh, and he, I think his father, John Miller, had a, a sort of a tenancy of a farm at west of, west of Colt Malundi. Uh, and uh, he basically, at the time he was born, it was in the hands of Drummond, but I think the Earl of Canoe eventually acquired the property. Uh, and that's a family that would be kind of influential in his career. This is uh, Tivermore Parish Church. Any of you that go down to the nice sort of tea room and the rest of it down at uh, Tivermore will, will probably have gone past this sort of church. And it's quite a nice sort of kirk. It uh, now belongs to the community. It's no longer in use as a church of Scotland. Uh, but interestingly enough, it has featured, the interior was featured uh, in an episode of Outlander set in the 1740s. So, you know, I feel as if it's, I'm not sure whether it was exactly like this in the 1740s, but they used the interior for the, uh, the shots when, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the main character, but her and one of the other characters are sort of pointed out as being witches because they have the BCG vaccination on their arms. If, you, if you've ever watched the series, if you haven't, then this will all be gibberish. <laughs> uh, but he was, he was basically a local lad, but he, he moved away from Perth, having sort of done an apprenticeship uh, as a writer. He ends up in Edinburgh, and then before too long, by about 1712, he's made the town clerk of Queen's Ferry, what we would today call South Queen's Ferry. Uh, and that's an interesting period in his life. But in the aftermath of the 1715 rebellion, he's actually prevailed upon to come back to Perth and act as the town clerk deputy. Uh, we think it's, it's sort of indicated from the records that he probably did his apprenticeship in the town clerk's office at Perth. Uh, so that sort of, sort of set up his legal career. Uh, and they obviously still knew him. Uh, and there's an indication that he was kind of, you know, lured back to Perth. But can only, I can only assume it's partly because he was untainted by any kind of Jacobite associations, because uh, the, the tomb clerk at the time uh, stayed on when there was a Jacobite magistracy replacing the, the Hanoverian magistracy. Uh, and uh, that, that made life somewhat difficult for him. So he was replaced in 1716 when things were reverted to normal after the, after the Jacobites left Perth. But you'll read more about that in the book. And there is another book out at the moment called The Fall of the Highlands, which looks at that in quite detail, that 1715 16 period in uh, Perth, which, uh, but that's a rival publication. So I shouldn't read it. <laughs> um, he, uh, when he comes back to Perth, he kind of sort of settles himself into Perth society. He's a deputy, but they, they, they try and make life as comfortable as possible for him. Fairly quickly, they're sort of looking at ways of, of boosting his, uh, his income, etc. cetera. Uh, and he, he, we, what survived in the, in the papers up in the archives upstairs, uh, amongst other things, are uh, his invitation lists for the baptisms of three of his children in the late 17 teens and early 1720s. I can't remember exactly which one of his children this is, but he's basically inviting the great and the good of Perth society, you know, the, the, the some local ministers. Uh, Mr. Black at the top there, we've got men on one side and women on the other. So we've got, uh, you know, the deans and guilds and provosts and all the rest of it, and uh, various clerks and baileys, et cetera. But uh, on the right-hand side, it's the, the, the wives and also, and daughters mentioned. But Mr. Black, who's the minister of, uh, I think, the East Church, he's certainly one of the sort of Church of Scotland ministers, features in the sort of story a little bit later on, because his daughter marries somebody who would become very significant in, in uh, George's life. Uh, we also uh, have uh, kind of lots of papers about his domestic arrangements and his life. Uh, there's, uh, this is one of his uh, surgeon's bills, you know, his medical man's bills, you know, for all the various ailments that he was having, you know, cooling ointments, 
distribution, potions, all sorts of things. You know, fascinating, really. You know, all the uh, camphor, uh, camphor spirits, etc. You can see some of the sort of things that he was having to order up there. And uh, James Creed. There's, there's a lot of well-known uh, names that appear in these records, as you would expect. Priest certainly a, a family who figure large in, in his career for his birth. Uh, this one's from really just a little bit later than it should have been, because it's when he's now become the town park of Perth. He starts out as the deputy, but the guy who's appointed as the sort of town clerk doesn't last that long. And uh, before too long, George is appointed a joint town clerk or a conjoint town clerk, as they called it. And it wasn't without his controversy. Uh, there was a lot of people objected to the whole idea of them having two town clerks. Why would you want two town clerks? You know, Edinburgh had two town clerks, but why would Perth? You know? But there's a whole stushy that goes on, and, and I cover that in this chapter about him becoming the town. Uh, and some of the people he might have expected to support him in this actually are a little bit against the, the, this innovation, unwarranted innovation. I was, I was mentioning that there was somebody that uh, Mr. Black, the minister's daughter married. Uh, this is John Glass, uh, who uh, is the sort of minister of Teeling in the sort of 1720s, uh, who actually forms a breakaway church. And amazingly enough, uh, George Miller, who's here living in Perth with his family, attends services in Teeling, which is all the way to Dundee and out the way of it. Uh, and he becomes an elder out there. Uh, but uh, John Glass becomes uh, his, uh, what's the word? The, the, he, had to, he was expelled really from the Church of Scotland. There's a specific word for it, which I've now forgotten. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he, he basically, took against the national covenants. He thought there was no justification in the Bible for the national covenants of the 17th century, which were a kind of the backbone of the sort of church of Scotland. And you know, it's almost like an act of faith that you have to sort of subscribe to these and believe in them. And Glass was against it. The, 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 the Kale Kirk, as it was known, uh, was a bit of a, a, it was an interesting sect. And uh, there were some pretty interesting people who belonged to it over the years. It was also known as the Sandemanians, and the Sandeman family were a big part of the glass eyed congregation. I mean, it starts off in Teeling, but it ends up with congregations all over Scotland and even down in London. Michael Faraday, for instance, was uh, a great sort of uh, follower of the glass uh, but also Robert Sandeman. Uh, goes off to the States and finds sort of uh, Sandemanian, but basically glass eyed congregations over in, in, the, in the colonies. I'm grateful to Matthew sitting there for getting this photograph of John Glass, uh, which features in the book. Some of the photographs I'm sure it will show you don't feature in the book because the, the uh, copyright permission was only for the book rather than for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, the fact that George Miller was a very important part of the Glassite uh, sect uh, is really here in this manuscript that's in the University Archives and done the book written by John Glass. Uh, and basically what he did was write it in these letters. He wrote his chapters and sent them off to George Miller to sort of you know, get his thoughts on it. Uh, before he had it published. And there's a note in the uh, in the bit to the printer saying, leave out the fact that this was in the form of letters. Just, you know, so George Miller's, it, he doesn't really transfer into the book, but obviously he was a, he was a good sounding board for John Glass when it came to the logical thoughts that he was having. I don't get me, I don't know enough about religion of this sort to be able to tell you what the, the details of it were, but for anybody who wants to see it from the University Archive. Um, George, uh, he wasn't only uh, um, a sort of, you know, he obviously had his legal business, he had the Glassite Church, but he was a, he was a King Gerdner. Uh, and uh, this is from uh, Archibald Eagle, who was the seedsman to the 
Honourable Society for the Improvement of Agriculture in Scotland, an Edinburgh merchant. Uh, so he's quite an important person, but he's having these this correspondence with George and sending him jewels uh, and flowers and <laughs> saying, you know, what to do with them. And I think this one on the outside says, you know, there's a it's a packet, don't crush it, and a post. <laughs> on it. So, uh, so there's there's all sorts of aspects of George's life beyond this uh, actual sort of day-to-day uh, -day jobs. Uh, obviously, the bit that was the selling point in terms of this is George and the Jacobites, you know, what happened to him then. So he, he, he was quite lucky in some ways that being in Queen's Ferry, the Jacobites never actually occupied South Queen's Ferry. They went close because there was a sort of a bit of a, in 1715, there was an attempt to take Edinburgh, but it, it, it didn't come to very much. Uh, and uh, so he was kind of unmolested. He probably was never faced with that decision. Do I stay? Do I go? The clash. Uh, so should I stay? Or should I go? Uh, or should I cooperate? Do I do I collaborate with them because you know they're the ones with the weapons? Uh, and you can understand that in Perth, this is what what the town clerk was faced with. You know, a lot of the magistrates scarped, but he was left there facing you know the Jacobite magistrates. Uh, so he never had that dilemma. But uh, in 1745, 46, I think the game, he, he probably scarred, but I don't know for a fact that he went to Edinburgh. There was a pretty good chance that he headed off to Edinburgh with the promise and some of the bailiffs and uh, some of the money. Uh, but uh, so he probably had to sit out the sort of uh, the winter of 1745 and the early part of 1746 in Edinburgh. Uh, but uh, here's somebody, and this is the point at which, depending on your point of view, you can kiss. Uh, this is the Duke of Cumberland, uh, who at the time was revered by the Whigs, etc., and a lot of people in Scotland and England for having delivered them from these uh, Highland men, this wild Highlanders. Uh, the, uh, the interesting enough, the uh, Guardian magazine had a little article. This weekend about uh, uh, how that sort of image of uh, the Duke of Cumberland changed over a hundred years, and basically Queen Victoria didn't like what he'd done to her beloved Highlanders, and had things changed on his monument. You know, took off any reference to Culloden, etc. But up until that point, I suspect you know all the, the Hanoverian successes of George II would have thought, you know, what a great guy. So Sweet William or the Butcher. Cumberland, you, you pay your money and you take your choice. Um, there's another picture of him in the book, uh, a different picture, which uh, very kindly allowed to be used by uh, the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Um, here's a, a letter from George Miller writing to some of the, you know, he, he, he's, he's acquiring other jobs by this stage. He's not just the tomb clerk, he's also the sheriff deputy. Uh, and that's where he really comes into his uh, a, an important phase of his life in dealing with the aftermath of the Jacobite uh, Rebellion of 1745-46. But he's here writing to Reverend Sir, and this is actually a letter addressed to a number of ministers, and he's basically asking them to sort of tell him about the people who weren't involved so that they don't fall under suspicion of uh, uh, of being kind of gathered up in that sort of whole kind of like, like who was it, who was involved, come get taken into sort of uh, captivity. Um, and there's a fair bit about his sort of interactions with people who either were or weren't sort of part of the, of the, the rising. Um, uh, and this is actually from the, the archives contains. Uh, very, uh, a number of volumes which contain all the evidence brought in against uh, people who were involved in the, uh, the rising, you know, whether they bore arms, whether they uh, just sort of supported or sort of gave money, etc. Uh, and I, I quite like this one because it's uh, Henry Kerr of Graydon being brought before the sheriff by a, a party of the king's troops on suspicion of treason and the sheriff Having examined him, I think this is George that's talking about it. If or not he did bear arms in the pretender's eldest son's army, 
Mr. Keller answers that he refuses everything. Uh, and the sheriff, having asked him if he is a Protestant, uh, he answered in the negative and says he is Roman Catholic or Popish then. <laughs> it's quite an interesting way. There's George Miller's unmistakable signature. That doesn't change all through his life. So we see lots of that sort of appearing in the records. Um, uh, he's involved, obviously, but what happens after uh, the Duke of Cumberland comes into Perth in February 1746 and heads off to Fort Augustus, they all, the, uh, the, the sort of pro Hanoverian Whig kind of magistrates get back together. They call together some of the prominent citizens, the loyal citizens, uh, and they say, How can we, you know, thank the Duke of Cumberland for delivering us from this? The perils which we face, uh, and we'll give him the Gary heads. They've basically have been trying to fold this off to somebody for years, but uh, you yeah, know they, uh, they they pass it on to, to the Cumberland, who fairly swiftly folds it off to the common artillery barracks. So that's uh, you, you've got to get your income where you can. Um, again, there's a different photograph of it in the uh, um, in the book. Uh, from the museum. Uh, flagrant scandal is uh, one of the things that uh, I noticed about George Miller from, from working in the archives over those years was that there was this accusation that fathered the child of Nick Sizemann's wife. Uh, and uh, it becomes quite a, a cause celebre or a flagrant scandal as the, as the Kirk session describe it. And it starts to become the subject of an investigation. Which is difficult for George because he doesn't recognize the authority of the Church of Scotland. So there's all sorts of difficulties, and that, that, that's sort of gone on to in quite detail in the book. Um, but there's no doubt that one of his one of his uh, great sort of important colleagues, Robert Craigie of Glen Doig, who is the Lord Advocate, I think, at this time, and goes on to become the Lord President later on. So quite an important. Uh, legal person in Scotland. Uh, he's um, almost a, 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 an exact contemporary of George Miller. Uh, he's, um, uh, but he's basically identifying it here as uh, the Jacobite plot, you know, to blacken George's name after the uh, after after 1746. It's around about 1748-49 that the, the whole sushi comes up, and the investigations, etc. Uh, and that, that's the part of the more salacious part of the book, I'll say, but I won't say any more than that. But, uh, um, <laughs> yes, so you read it, you make your choice. Was he a wolf in sheep's clothing or not? But, uh, uh, in later life, he, he acquires other jobs as well. He becomes the clerk to the justices of the peace. Uh, and uh, this is actually a list of the justices, and George's name appears about halfway down on the left. Uh, George Miller, town clerk of Perth, but he also becomes the clerk of the uh, of the justices of the peace. So he's like a sheriff deputy, clerk to the justices of the peace, town clerk. So he is a man who's starting to amass a fair amount of important posts to himself. Uh, so he's quite a powerful person, um, rather than just being the servant of the town council. He must, in some ways, have been somebody that had to deal with as well, and is with his, wearing his different hats. Um, I feel as if um, the, the, he gets initially the, the the sort of clerkship as one of the sort of rewards for his services to the government after Culloden, after the, the rising. Uh, and uh, more about that, really. His pal, Robert Craigie, uh, is uh, this is the, the, the sort of nice house that he, he gets built in about 1750 at Glendoyke. So, a lot of people will know him as Robert Craigie of Glendoyke, and he becomes Lord Craigie when he becomes a Lord President, uh, and, you know, just behind the garden center, basically. Uh, and uh, a rather fine house. Um, but uh, George actually takes on the task of sort of improving or arranging for the improvement of the road between Perth 
and there's, there's various references to that in the book. But Robert Craig, who was one of his close associates, is not that keen on where they're putting it. I suspect it's because it's coming a bit close to his front door. The original line of the road was a bit near the river, but they're starting to, to put this new line a bit close to him, and he's coming up with objections to why he doesn't think it's a good idea. So we end with a, a conclusion, always a, always a good place to end. Um, and uh, it's really um, just to sort of recap his life. Uh, I mean, he, he spent probably the best part of 50 years working for Perth Town Council, which puts even the sort of 38, nearly 40 years I worked in the shape. So if you, if you can't have been probably an apprentice, uh, then coming back as a deputy in 1716, uh, being made the town of in 1723 and dying in 1763. Uh, that's that's quite a lot of years in the service of first town council. Uh, and uh, he uh, he wasn't always popular. There were certainly people who, who didn't like him at all. Uh, and uh, some who thought he was probably a stand-up guy. So I think, uh, as Chris alluded to, uh, Scotland was a very divided society at that time. So. He had his enemies and his friends. Uh, this, this, uh, I'm grateful to my former colleagues at the archives for sending me this little extract from the uh, chart of the magistracy and officials of the, of the town council. Uh, and uh, if you've looked, it's got all the people who uh, um, were sort of town clerks and deputies, etc. And you can see the name Miller appearing. Uh, on and off uh, over a very long period of time. So we know that George got his son Walter to be a deputy and then join him as the conjoint, Tom and Clark. His younger son Patrick uh, became the deputy and in time the actual town clerk. And then Patrick's grandson, John Miller, was the town clerk up until 1837. Uh, so you could sort of say from 1716, almost the beginning of the Georgian area up until the start of the Victorian era, the Millers were, were the people who uh, had their fingers on the sort of levers of power in Perth and certainly were very influential. So I hope if you uh, get the book, you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's been fun trying to put it together. I'm grateful to Chris for all his, his input and his help in sort of getting it to publication. To Matthew and my colleagues on the uh, Abate Historical Society for, for, uh, for letting me do it. Uh, I hope it's not been too much of a vanity project, but uh, uh, it's been, you know, yeah, it's been a lot of fun sort of doing the research and it gave me the chance to keep in touch with my old workplace for the uh, five, well, at least the first three years after I retired until uh, things got a bit more difficult. But uh, then that's been true for everyone. So thank you very much and uh, thanks for coming.